connected. And uh, I, I feel that uh, a person like yourself, with all due respect, uh, are not paying close enough attention to uh, the specific matter of reaction criticism to look at how uh, the material has changed as we go from, from Mark to Matthew and Luke and then finally John. Okay, well, let me ask a question about that. Uh, what physical evidence, do you, do you claim any physical evidence for having knowledge uh, that uh, Matthew possessed a manuscript of Mark and was <coughs> This is not based on physical evidence. This is based on uh, many centuries of historical studies. If we get uh, historical studies of what? I'm getting to that. Well, well, if we have two documents that are very similar to each other, we naturally wonder if there is a common source from which both documents derive. When scholars have looked uh, closely at the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they started to put in a source for the three because they're so similar in, in the, the outline of events and even in the narration of uh, singular events within that broad outline. And uh, the more they try to reconstruct what that source would have been based on the common material between the three, the more that source began to, the more and more that source looked like Mark's gospel itself. At one point, they called it an or Marcus, a source of Mark, an earlier uh, uh, version of Mark's gospel, and eventually they felt that it's not even necessary to do that, uh, though the nuance is necessary at times. I understand all that, but the problem is, have you looked at the worldview that is behind the production of this, these theories? Because what you're presenting to us are theories. You don't have any manuscripts of John that are different than what John is saying. You don't have any manuscripts of Mark. You have no solid evidence. What you have uh, is, is scholars who could not believe, well, well let me put it this way, you, you said Jesus predicted uh, the apocalypse in his own lifetime, right? No, I didn't say that. You said that Jesus predicted the apocalypse, you, you, you said that as a Muslim you would not believe that the words attributed to him. Okay, so someone else uh, put those words in Jesus' mouth. This is what a Muslim would, would want to believe, yeah. Okay, why do you believe that the words of Jesus recorded in the Gospel are talking about the Apocalypse and not merely the destruction of Jerusalem back in chapter 24. Uh, the, the studies regarding this uh, have led to very clear conclusions. Uh, the uh, sayings which are attributed to Jesus speak about the destruction and says that uh, many of those who are standing here uh, it, it will not take that until it happens. One, and it also says that this will happen within the lifetime of this generation. This generation will not pass away until all of these things happen. Uh, Jesus looked at uh, the, uh, the, the, the temple wall, the, the western wall of the Jerusalem temple, and he says that the destruction will be so complete that uh, not one brick will be left standing on another. Uh, but as, uh, uh, as uh, uh, Raymond Brown points out in his book, Jesus, God, and Man, uh, the wall is still standing tall. So the, a Muslim would say this is not the words of Jesus. Uh, these, these are something else that people have attributed to Jesus. So here's, here's my question. Uh, it, the Christian scholars, well, for, for almost 2,000 years, have answered all of those objections and demonstrated what Jesus is talking about. Why is it that you listen to and, and apply the liberals who do not believe in inspiration and do not believe in the prophetic voice but you as a Muslim have already said you believe in a prophetic voice, and you would apply in interpreting the Quran about the sun setting in a muddy pool of water, you would interpret that in a literary genre and allow that. Why don't you allow one stone left upon another to be interpreted in the exact same way, that it's complete destruction, not, well, there's a western wall over there, I think I see two bricks, therefore he was wrong. I see a complete distinction in the application of, of that worldview that you're using to my scriptures then you would use an interpreting your own. First of all, it's not just two bricks of the entire Western Wall. Uh, the second, uh, the, uh, even as a Muslim, I, I must have uh, my rationality intact. I look at very clear uh, evidence and I draw my conclusions. Uh, when something is said so clearly that it will happen and that it doesn't happen, well then I have to admit that, that there is an error here, something is, is wrong. And the same thing will have to be admitted, whether it's about the Quran or the Hadith or any aspect of whether Muslim or Christian or Jewish or whatever, that text. I, I believe we should not sacrifice our rationality uh, for the purpose of faith. Faith and rationality uh, go, go together. Uh, one informs the other, one inspires the other. <laughs> Dr. Alley, your turn now to question Dr. White. Okay. 
Uh, uh, Dr. White, uh, in, in your opening uh, remarks, you said that uh, uh, Muslims here are in a dilemma because, uh, on the one hand, uh, they, they, the Quran approves of, of the gospel, and at the same time, the Quran does not approve, approve of doctrines which uh, grow out of the gospel, such as, as you say, the, the divinity of. I, I didn't say they approve the gospels. I said that Surah 547 uses an imperative command to uh, the al al -Anjil to judge by what is contained in the gospel. And therefore, the gospel had to exist for them to be able to fulfill the commandment that's found in the Quran. Yeah, I'm not asking you about anything different. That, that's precisely what I'm asking you about. So since you said that, and have you paid attention to the fact that the verse says, and let them judge by what God has revealed in the Quran. Yes. So what does that mean to you? Well, obviously, uh, given the flow of 544 to 48, it is an argument, literally, for the uh, prophet of Muhammad. It's, it's the Torah is sent down to Moses, which is like guidance. Jesus comes, he's given the Injil, he confirms what came before, the Injil has light and guidance. Now Muhammad has come, he's been given the Quran, what he is given has light and guidance, it confirms that which came before, in fact acts as a hymen over that. And so it's, a, it's an unbroken chain that is supposed to convince both Jews and Christians, I am the continuation of this thing that God has been doing all along. And so the, what was said is, if you will not judge, if the Jews will not judge for what's in the Torah, they are coppers, they're unbelievers, they are the unrighteous. And so they're being told to judge by what is contained in what they possess. And so the only way that that can have a fulfillment is if they actually possess the Injil in which is like guidance. Because if what they possess has been corrupted, then there's no light and guidance left. Oh, but that's in it. What if there, there is some light and guidance left in it, though all of it is not... Uh, in its original and pure form. Well, it would seem to me that uh, there would be some incumbent uh, necessity upon the Quran to give warning and say, well, and here's how you, how you determine, because I listened to you just on, on Tuesday, and I, again, since some of these recordings are very old, I, I want to find out whether you still hold these positions or not. I, I don't want to assert something to you that you no longer hold. But you actually quoted Surah 547 from the Quran, either in the debate against the, the one that's Fellows or a fellow had a very high pitch of I don't remember which one it was, maybe other than you. But you quoted it and you said that if Christians would simply examine their traditions in depth, they would be able to see these different levels and, and discover the real Muslim Jesus underneath all these different levels. Is that still how you would understand it? And that's part of what I would understand with regard to this verse. Oh, okay, okay. I, I would just simply say, I. I does not cross my mind, uh, and I don't think it crossed the mind of uh, Ibn Kathir, or al or anybody else, uh, that what Surah 547 is saying is, wait for about 1400 years for redaction criticism to develop, use that to atomize the text of the New Testament, and then you'll find the Muslim Jesus. Because no one that Muhammad was talking to at that time would have any earthly idea of what he was talking about, and I think that if the Quran makes an argument that was meant to be convincing to the people to whom it was addressed, they would have to have some idea what the argument was. Okay, I'll address this in my rebuttal, but let me uh, move to a different topic. Uh, the Gospel according to Mark, as I've said, uh, according to these scholars, uh, Raymond Bennett, uh, Richard Baltham, and uh, Edward Bruce is the earliest of the four. Do you agree with that? No. Um, and so, I agree with Nancy Wright. We don't know. We do not have any evidence. Uh, the early church thought Matthew was the first. Uh, a computerized study recently made Luke the first. Uh, the fact of the matter is that barring the discovery of the originals with date stamps on them, it is always a matter of conjecture. And I suggest, along with a number of scholars, uh, that the best way to approach this is not to assume literary dependence and close the doors to everything else. But there is something else that Richard Bauckham himself, in his book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, emphasizes very strongly. And that is the eyewitnesses were still alive during the time of the writing of the Gospels. And there was this thing called oral tradition. I think that's why you see those differences, is because Mark's writing to one, one audience, Matthew's writing to another audience, Luke is writing to another audience, they're drawing from the same oral tradition, and they emphasize different aspects. Not that they're sitting there. Luke says he used other written sources, so if Luke has other written sources, I don't have any problem with that. But the idea of sitting around and creating a snowball and, and inserting a certain, well, let's, let's be honest, what you're saying is they were being dishonest with the text. They were, they were literally 
creating a religion that would, that would prompt people to commit massive acts of shirk. I mean, we can't say these people were morally neutral in doing this. I think we need to be open about this. If we're going to say Paul and John especially were just really bad guys, then we need to be open saying they're really bad guys. But, but no, I believe that I do, I do not know who was written first. Mark may have been. But I actually uh, look at the information and go, you know why most people put the dates on that you put on Mark and those things? Because they don't believe in prophecy. They don't believe they couldn't prophesy the destruction of Jerusalem. You and I believe in prophecy. So I would put Mark in the late 50s at, at, the, at the latest, Luke and Matthew in, in, in the, the 60s, and some people have made strong arguments for John 370. I know Hebrews is 370. There's, I don't think there's any question about that. Okay, now, you know in previous debates that you have accused me of just following liberal scholars. And, and I've come to great pains to find conservative scholars. They're very few. <laughs> and, and you have admitted you know, here. I need to bring now, you more books. Okay, <laughs> but, 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 the fact that we have, I, 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 I brought you with Richard Balcom. Uh, F.F. Bruce. Now, I know you're the next person hesitation about Richard Baltimore. I'd like to know what's wrong about him. But let me get to my question. Okay. My question then is, are you still going to accuse me of following liberal scholars when I have admitted that I don't follow liberal scholars? Well, I don't think you're going to accuse me of following liberal scholars. I think you're going to accuse me of following liberal scholars. I'm saying that this is the date of Mark and that Mark is the earliest of the four. I am going to accuse you of not listening to the large portion of us who argue against those things and who say the reason of the popularity in quote-unquote Christian scholarship of these things is due to an anti-supernaturalistic bias. Shabir, what I've always said to you is that is exactly what you said to Bob Morey in your debate when I quoted it to you. You're a supernaturalist, but you take off your supernaturalist perspective when you read our scholars, and hence you don't recognize when these folks are functioning on a foundation that says, well, it's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, so it has to be after the destruction of Jerusalem. So both Richard Balcom and F.F. Bruce are anti-supernaturalists? No, now wait a minute. You're confusing here the order of the Gospels and the dating of the Gospels. And the idea that someone can someone can say there, there are conservative scholars that might put Mark and Matthew and these others very late for reasons other than anti-supernaturalist ones. But the people who, for example, cut John up into parts without any historical evidence that these stages ever existed, in a way that you wouldn't even agree with the way they put it back together again, they are functioning from a worldview that fundamentally says we are embarrassed by the existence of the supernatural in our text. And so we will try to explain it away, just as you know, there are liberal Muslims who are embarrassed by the presence of the supernatural in their text. But I don't think you and I are ready to explain those things away or dismiss the presence of the supernatural in our text. Yeah, are we? Unless, unless you start saying that Bruce and, and Balcom are anti-supernaturalists and they're no longer um, uh, Conservative scholars, I will not see your point. But I have another question for you. Uh, you have written that Mark ends with chapter 16, verse number 8, in which case you are doing away with the longer ending. Now, if Matthew was written first, that's going to be really strange. Okay. If, if Matthew was written first, what would be the need for Mark? If Mark was written first, isn't it a natural that, that the that way in which somebody has tried to improve upon Mark by giving it a longer ending, that Matthew and Luke have also improved upon Mark by giving their own see, see, alternative ending? Two, two things. You're not seeing what Richard Baldwin emphasizes and what Edward Bruce emphasizes. And that is the Gospel of Mark existed in a time when the charisma, the spoken word, the spoken tradition, was the very essence in which that Gospel was presented. And secondly, you're assuming literary independence so that everybody would know Matthew, and therefore, if everybody knows Matthew, then there's no reason for Mark to have a short ending because there's all that stuff in Matthew. We don't, we didn't, we live in a day of cell phones and PDAs and the internet, and, and information goes around so fast, most of us can't even keep up with it. That was not the situation back then. You could live in an, in a, in an area of your entire life and never travel more than seven miles from where you were born. So the, the idea that everybody would have known, well, Matthew's already written his gospel. It's on the internet, isn't it? And there would have been an entire, Mark may have been living in a place where he's never heard of a written something called the gospel of Matthew. And so the, the, the assumption, I think, misunderstands the, the context. And, and I didn't say that F.F. Bruce and, and Richard Balcom are liberals. I said I would have differences with both of them on certain aspects. 
And there's a difference between the dating of the Gospels and things like that. But Balcom himself, if you read Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, emphasizes the fact that those books were being written during the lifetime of the Eyewitnesses, and that functioned as a control so that we can trust the text of the New Testament. So I would certainly agree with him on, on that note. All right. We now move to the next phase, which is 10 minutes each of rebuttals, starting with Dr. White. about the sources that the Quran utilized. 
Uh, Surah 19 has Jesus speaking from, from, his, from his cradle. That's in the Arabic infancy gospels written 150 years earlier. There are lots of scholars. Every single scholar that Shabir was quoting would agree, oh yeah, but there's, there's reliance there. Do you accept that? Do you accept that type of application? If not, why not? And if you want other people to handle your text fairly, you need to listen to what we're saying when we try to handle our text fairly. For example, Shabir said, well, there's, there's many texts in the, in, the, in the New Testament that show Jesus as a man, a prophet of God. Every Christian on the planet believes that Jesus was a man and a prophet of God. It's just that he wasn't just that. Yes, he was a prophet. He was priest. He was king. But he was so much more than that. He truly was man. He had to be, to be the sacrifice for our sins. So yes, we believe that he was a man, he was a prophet of God. But all of this material, and I do want to just mention really quickly, uh, Shabir, the issue about Kudios in Mark 13, 35 and Matthew 24 came up in our debate at Viola in 2006. And I asked him during cross-examination, because what you've been saying, and I heard you say it again on recording, but again, I don't know how old it was, that uh, this is a, an example of an exaltation of Jesus because in Matthew it says kudios, and in Mark it says master of the house, and, and Lord is higher than that. Both use the term kudios. Ha kudios te soikios is the term in Mark 13, 35. The master of the house uses kudios. If anything, this would be another example of Matthew using a, or, or Mark uh, using a longer form, when Matthew uses a shorter form, which he did very, very often in his recounting of various incidents. I did bring up the Shema. Jesus believed in the Shema. But that same Jesus quoting Shema, who said, Shema Yisrael Yahweh Elohim Yahweh Akad, accepted the worship of his disciples, even in the Synoptic Gospels. How can you deal with that? How can you deal with the fact that the Apostle Paul, writing within the first decades, takes that very same Shema in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and he, he, he sees its fulfillment in the coming of the Son, that there is one God, the Father, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, using the very same language from the Greek Septuagint that the Shema was expressed in, that most uh, uh, Jews who did not live in Palestine would have understood it. And by the way, the fig tree issue, why was Jesus talking about the fig tree? And why are Muslims so fascinated with the fig tree issue? <laughs> come up over and over again. Folks, the fig tree represents Israel. Jesus is going into Jerusalem. He is about to have all the encounters with the Jewish leaders. He's saying that Israel looks like it has fruit. It's got all the outward trappings and the pretty buildings and the prayer shawls and everything else. But there is no fruit. There is no real life. That's what the whole fig tree parable is all about. It wasn't Jesus ignorant of what time figs were. He grew up in that area. Do you really think? I mean, it would almost be like someone, someone in Toronto. Uh, saying, well, it's on the snowing in March. Well, it's not now, is it? You know when it's supposed to be snowing here. <laughs> and it's not right now. It's hot in here. You got sand or something. <laughs> yeah, in Arizona, and it's hot in here. I mean, really. Jesus knew what the season of things was. He was making a point about the people of Israel. They weren't walking after God. This is clearly what is there. When you look at the crucifixion narratives that, uh, that, that he brought up, well, you know, Mark has one view, John has the other. I'm working through those right now in teaching, and my, my friends, again, I just find this to be a very surface level reading of the text. The truth is much deeper, and if you'll just allow the text to speak for itself, but these folks will not allow, the, 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 the folks that, that Shabir, I think, has been most deeply influenced by, will not allow the text to speak for itself. And that takes me back to the dilemma, and I'll be interested in hearing what Shabir has to say about it. But if I try to obey the command, and the first word of Surah 547 is in the imperative, you can, you can confirm that form if you would, Shabir, in the Arabic, it's in the imperative form, it says, judge. The people of the gospel are to judge by what's contained therein. The only object, the only antecedent for fihi there is the gospel. How am I supposed to do that? When I do that, I find that the revelation of the Quran comes from someone who didn't know my gospel, didn't know my New Testament. My, my New Testament wasn't translated into the Arabic language. The earliest manuscripts we have are from the end of the ninth century. And if you believe that Muhammad was illiterate, illiterate he had no access to my gospel. He may well have believed that what he was saying was consistent and that the gospel would support him. But he was wrong, and that's why we're here this evening. 
And if I love you, I will say that, not out of disrespect to you, but out of honor for my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's why we must understand and hear what we're saying so often we pass by, what, what each one of us is saying. And that's why I'd like to say to Shabir, let me recommend some books to you to read from folks who actually believe God has spoken, rather than the folks who are, who are embarrassed by prophecy or embarrassed by the supernatural nature of Scripture. And I think that you'll discover that there's a lot of us out there. <coughs> this evening, we've asked the question, did Jesus claim deity? I've demonstrated that the only way to understand the text is that he did. And that really is the issue we need to be focused upon this evening. Thank you very much for your time. Dr. Ali now has his 10 minute rebuttal. <laughs> now, uh, folks, uh, to respond to what Shane uh, uh, said and to make sense of the cross examination period, first of all, I would say that Quran 5, uh, verse 47, is not telling Christians that all of the Injil is uh, preserved and accurate and, and is the Word of God. It says, well, Let the people of the Gospel judge by that which God has revealed therein. So it's not all of it, it's what God has revealed therein. Some of its contents are good and the moon, uh, uh, guidance and light. But have you ever read any of the list of ingredients of the things that you eat? It's not only one thing. So you might say something is in there, but that's not the whole thing. It's got that, plus it's got some other things. So uh, from the Quranic perspective, the Angel does have some truth and guidance from God, but it has other things besides. And in my presentation, I've illustrated what are some of these other things. There are changes. So that whereas in fact in, in Mark's Gospel, Jesus appears on many occasions as a human being with limitations, as subscribing to a God, a higher power than himself. In the later Gospels, there are attempts to remove that distinction between Jesus and his God, and to make Jesus appear more and more divine, as we go from Mark to Matthew and Luke, and then finally to John. Uh, James uh, talks a lot about Shabir's inconsistency. When it comes to the Quran, Shabir is just listening to people who believe in the Quran. When it comes to the Gospels and to Jesus, you're listening to hyper-critical liberal scholars who reject everything supernatural. I don't believe this is true. It, it is true that I do have my bias as a Muslim. I cannot deny that. And when I do approach the world of information out there, I have to be selective. Not everybody can learn everything all at once. There are certain things that we find attractive, certain things that we do not. But I do listen to criticism. I do listen to suggestions from James. And I do investigate what he advises that I investigate. For example, in my last debate, he, invest, he advised me to investigate the writings of Leon Morris. Last night, I was at Trinity, Trinity Graham Library into the late hours uh, at, at the University of Toronto studying the writings of Leon Morris. He also had, had advised me to study F.F. Bruce in my last debate. And so I got books by F.F. Bruce. Uh, I studied these works, and I cited from F.F. Bruce. But then that's still not good enough. So what do we have to do then? Uh, and as a Muslim, am I expected to just listen to those Christians who say that Jesus is God and then believe in everything they say? Obviously, this would be too much. Just as I do not expect James to listen to the Muslim scholars who say that uh, the Quran is the word of God and, and, and just end it right there. I expect him as a non-Muslim to investigate, to listen to all sides of the question, uh, to study and then to form his own conclusions about what is right and what is wrong, what he can believe in the end. I believe this is precisely what I'm doing. I have uh, uh, been led to believe that Richard Balcom is a very uh, conservative scholar. And in fact, in some of uh, our past encounters, I'm sure that James had recommended Richard Balcom. In fact, I recall seeing uh, Richard Balcom's name on the list of uh, books that uh, James had circulated for uh, rec as recommended readings. But now, I quoted from Richard Balcom, and this is still not good enough. 
So I, I pointed out in a written piece some time ago that uh, it, it becomes frustrating when we try to dialogue and uh, we're being told that, that your, di your dialogue is approaching this from the wrong angle. And when we ask for the right angle, uh, we are led to a certain path and then we're still told that that's the wrong angle when it turns out that what we're citing from the conservative Christian scholars is still not uh, good enough. Now, when it comes to the Torah, of course, as a Muslim, I keep my mind open. Uh, I, I read, as I said, uh, writings from a wide variety of sources, those who are critical of, of the Quran. Those who will say, for example, as James pointed out, that the Quran, in speaking about Jesus, depends on apocryphal sources. So I have to have a way of putting them all together. And the way I understand this is that the Word of God, the Quran, that speaking from divine authority, uh, draws the attention of people to the divine truth, and in doing so, God uses whatever people knew at the time as a starting point. And this is logical argumentation. The Quran is a hujja, it is an argument. So it's a logical argument starts with premises that will be acceptable to the people that you are presenting your argument to. to and then you build upon that. So if some people knew the stories about Jesus from apocryphal sources, the Quran starts there and then develops its own theology out of that. Some people knew the stories as they are in the Gospels. The Quran starts there and then de develops its own theology from, from that. In any case, the Quran arrives at the same place that Jesus is a prophet, a messenger, and the Messiah of God, but still a servant and a humble worshiper of God who has been made into God by other people who claim that for him. The Quran says, They follow the sayings of those who have disbelieved of old. It's not that the Quran is ignorant of what the New Testament says and of what Christians believe. It is that the Quran just doesn't agree with that. The Quran, in fact, when studied carefully, shows detailed knowledge of what Christians uh, believe. In, in my cross-examination, I asked uh, James about his view regarding Mark's Gospel, ending at chapter 16, verse number 8, in which case there is no description in Mark's Gospel of Jesus actually appearing to his disciples after the event uh, of his burial. There is a promise that he would appear in Galilee, but no description of, the, of, of his actual appearance. The last we hear is that women fled from the tomb, telling no one about this because they were afraid. So the question is, how did anybody hear about this? If the women told no one. Somebody then appended a long uh, conclusion to Mark's Gospel, somebody appended a short conclusion, and somebody put the two together, and somebody else put a further insert into the longer conclusion. And that shows you how the gospel materials have been handled over time. This is only the hard evidence that we have showing the corruption in motion and, and, and now requiring that these added portions be removed. But we don't know what happened during that oral period. Didn't James say that the material was transmitted orally for a while? Well, we don't have the hard evidence of how the changes occurred. But if you have something in writing before you and you're still going to change it, then we're going to ask you, what did you do during the oral period? when there was no, nothing to cross-check against what you are writing. So if the writing was changed, then the oral tradition was probably changed even more. And this is the Quran's point, that people said things regarding Jesus which are not true, they made him into a god. A change replied to my uh, statements regarding uh, the destruction uh, of, of the, uh, the, the, the temple wall. He, he was responding to the destruction of Jerusalem. That's not my point. Yes, the, Jerusalem was destroyed during the, the, the lifetime of those who were Jesus. But that was not the prophecy. There were two prophecies. One is that the apocalypse, the actual day of judgment, will occur. Jesus will come back from the clouds of heaven. And two was that the temple wall will be so completely destroyed that not a stone will be left upon the other. According to historians, both of these prophecies were uttered by Jesus and both failed. And Muslim will say, I will not go by the historians in this case. It looks like somebody else said this about Jesus, but they said it so early and, and, and so uh, widespread that now all historians can do is submit to this evidence and say, well, it looks like Jesus said this on the criterion of embarrassment. The Christians would not have invented this. Uh, and, and so it looks like Jesus said it and Jesus' prophecies failed. For a Muslim, this cannot be because it would mean that Jesus is a false prophet. Because the Deuteronomy chapter 13 says that if a prophet says that something will happen, then it doesn't happen. That is a false prophet. Deuteronomy 18 as well. And for Muslims, Jesus is a true prophet. So we won't accept all of what.
what these liberal historians are saying, but we keep an open mind, we examine, and uh, we study. What about the fig tree episode? And uh, James did precisely what I said that Christians do. They go to Matthew's uh, uh, recollection of the event, and then they make that into a parable, into a story, into a lesson. But, and then he made a, a lot of fun about it. I enjoyed that. It was very funny. <laughs> and Jesus knowing about the seasons. But Mark is very precise. The reason that the tree had no fruit is because it was not the season for figs. Jesus went up thinking that he will find fruit, but then he did not find fruit because it was not the season for figs. In, in, in Mark's narrative, it is very clear that Jesus was mistaken, and then Matthew tried to correct that to remove this uh, 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 clear conclusion that Jesus was uh, mistaken. So, it, 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 finally, Mark's gospel uh, ending as it does. What has happened after all of these people tried to put the long ending, the short ending, and so on? Mark's gospel was not deemed sufficient to proclaim the Christian faith. And James, in his book, mentioned that this is the reason why people added. Well, why did Matthew and Luke write other gospels? Not only because Mark was in short supply, it, but because they wanted to now show the faith in Jesus. Jesus did appear, and here is the story. That's according to Mark, Mark and Matthew and Luke, revising the story. John revised it even further. We want to get back to the true original story. That, to me, is the Quranic depiction of Jesus. Thank you very much. We now come to your opportunity to participate. There will be 30 minutes of questions and answers. The microphone is here. Would you please line up? State your question very concisely and on topic. If you are not on topic, we will ask you to stand aside so the person behind you can And also state for whom the question is. We'll give you a couple of moments to line up. Uh, the person who is being addressed will make his comment and then the other person will be given Rob. 30 seconds to uh, comment on it. Rob. One minute and 30 seconds. And that will be only one question per person. Okay, we can begin with the first question now. Let's begin. Dr. Ellie, thank you very much for what you shared tonight. I appreciate it. Um, as someone who believes in the deity of Jesus, I have a guarantee and I have a hope because of what the Bible says. Now I can quote to you James 1, 5, 11 through 13 if you'd like, but it clearly says, as James says, when you listen to the text, that I have a guarantee and a hope. Not a guaranteed hope, a guarantee. What's your hope based on the Torah? Uh, my answer to that is that uh, the Muslim hope is very similar to the Christian hope, though it is presented by Muslims and Christians differently. You just said, you just spoke of having a guarantee, and one might get the impression that you mean that your name is actually mentioned in the book of James from the passages that you're mentioning. And obviously you don't mean that. You mean that there is a general promise that if you believe and if you do what is right, you subscribe to this way, then you will be saved. A similar guarantee is given to Muslims as well. Uh, that if you believe, you do what is right, you will be saved. God is forgiven, he's merciful, and he takes care of you in the end. Dr. White, your response? Well, uh, I basically, I thought the best response I'd give to that is ask if maybe you all would be interested in seeing Shabir and I discuss the differences we have in the doctrine of salvation sometime in the not too distant future. <laughs> It's a vitally important issue. I don't want to brush it off. In 30 seconds, I also can't hardly say anything overly meaningful about it. So I'm just saying I'm open to, to our having the opportunity to do that. And it looks like we've got a group here that we usually see. And I'm, I'm interested as well. 
Okay, thank you very much. Sounds like a great incoming debate. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, my question is to uh, for Shikali. Um, actually, how can you deny the explicit uh, de deity of Christ in, in the Quran? So uh, there's a couple of evidence written in the Quran. Uh, first of all, Jesus created, and actually, as a matter of fact, the God defied anybody that in the Quran that would, uh, or Allah, sorry, uh, that defied anybody that could create uh, in the Quran. Uh, this is written in uh, verse 46, Surah 46, 4, 4. However, we find Jesus actually creating uh, a bird from the mud the same exact way that God created Adam by going into a mud kind of thing of tea in, in, in Arabic. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, verse 14 in the Mu'mineen is actually mentioned, mentioned that God is the best creator because of Jesus creating. Uh, there's also evidence that he is eternal. Your question, please. So, so my question is, what do you say about those evidence that God is, is Jesus is eternal also in the Quran because he is the word of God and the word of God was not created at one time. It is eternal and everything that is eternal is God. Um, okay, well, the, the, we cannot, in, in any reasoning, uh, start with the conclusion that we want to get at and then make everything a rigid conclusion. That would be circular reasoning. What we, are, we can start with is the plain scriptural teaching, both in the Bible and the Quran, that there is only one God. As James himself has said, uh, Yahweh is the only God, besides him there is no other. This is mentioned again and again. When this is so very clear, then finding that some one other than God has great miraculous powers, uh, that does not prove that the other person is God, otherwise scripture will contradict itself, both the Bible and, and the Quran. Uh, what we do uh, find is that uh, the, Jesus is able to do certain things by the permission of God, as the Quran says, be in love. So he does it with the permission of God. God is an absolute creator, and Jesus is able to uh, put life into these words by the permission of God. He is dependent on the creator, he himself is not the absolute creator. So we have one absolute creator, the ever-living God, and we have a servant Jesus who is granted some special powers by God's permission. Uh, I would just point out that that particular story is, uh, again, the place where the Quran is dependent upon an extra a source outside of revelation that is, in fact, ahistorical. It's, it's not true. Uh, but Jesus is described in Scripture as having the power to do that because he is the creator of all things. And that, again, is one of the earliest elements of Christian profession. We have to explain how is it the disciples of Jesus could be so easily and quickly overcome when in the very first centuries they were teaching, the very first years they were teaching these things. Next question. Thank you very much, both gentlemen, for excellent debate. My question is for uh, Mr. Shabir Ali. Um, all of the disciples of Jesus Christ, they died for their faith. If they are so bad guys and they were just making lies, and still they were willing to lay down their life for whatever, whatever is written in the Bible. I come from Pakistan and in police there, they are very strict. They kill you, like they beat you like anything. And if they catch me and they put an allegation on me, did you steal it? They will beat me so much that I will say, yes, I steal it. Even they lie. I Your question, please. So, how come these guys were willing to lay their own life for such a lie that they have own fabrication? Yeah. And to begin with, I do not say that the disciples fabricated uh, what uh, we are hearing about now. I say that this, the, the, the idea that Jesus is God actually came after the disciples of, of Jesus. We, if we look at what the disciples themselves believe, as is depicted in the Acts of the Apostles in the Bible, we find that they were uh, continually in the temple, they were observing the Jewish Sabbath, they were praying along with Jews, and they, they were speaking of Jesus as the servant of the God of Abraham, and we know from the Old Testament that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as they were speaking about, is the only one God, Yahweh Jehovah, who declared that he is the only God. And throughout, shall we find that the disciples make a distinction between God and Jesus. They refer to Jesus as a servant of God, and God as someone else other than Jesus. It is later, Stephen, for example, who prayed to Jesus. It is Paul who went into the temple and, and uh, immediately began preaching that Jesus Christ is the Son of God in Acts chapter 9, verse 20. But the disciples were continually, every Sabbath, proclaiming that Jesus is the Messiah, according to the last verse of chapter 5 of the Acts of the Apostles, and that is precisely what Muslims do believe. Unfortunately, what Shabir said does not begin to disprove what Christians believe on the subject. We believe everything the disciples said, but that's not all they said. The problem is, if you're going to say that 
that Stephen or Paul or those other people perverted the, the truth, then you have no reason to trust anything in the New Testament whatsoever. I demonstrate that the earliest traditions we have that you can identify in the New Testament text identify Jesus Christ with Yahweh. That does not mean another God. To say, well, that means you believe in two gods is to misunderstand what we believe about the God of the Trinity. Next question, please. Uh, just uh, get one shot at this. So, um, Muslims believe that Jesus is the Messiah. This is addressed for sure. Oh, sorry, this is addressed to both, actually. I'd like you both to respond, if okay. you don't mind. Okay. Okay. The book of Zechariah, the book of Micah, and Isaiah all claim that the coming Messiah would be eternal. Zechariah 2, 10, Isaiah 9, 6, Micah 5, uh, 3, 5, or 5, 3, forget it. Anyway. Yeah, five, sorry, five, two, and three says that his origins would be from everlasting, from eternity. So uh, if he was the Messiah and not and not divine, not eternal, well, God alone is eternal, was he indeed the Messiah or was he a false Messiah? The Messiah has to be eternal and God alone is eternal. Well, my response to that would be to say that uh, the, uh, the, the Bible is... is comprised, as you know, of many books, uh, of, of varying levels of divine involvement in, in their writing. Of course, from one perspective, all of the Bible is inspired of God and prophet of teaching and so on. We, we know that. But at the same time, there are direct proclamations from God. There is the Torah, which is distinguished from the rest of the Old Testament. And in the Torah, the Ten Commandments has a special position. Uh, when in the Ten Commandments, it is so very clear that uh, you shall have no other God but Yahweh, but Jehovah. And uh, Jehovah is not like anything that walks on the earth or flies in the sky or swims in the ocean. He's not. Jehovah is the creator of all of these things. Now, if later on, if there are writers of some parts of the Bible who start to speak of other creatures, whether it be angels or um, other spirits uh, who are of, conceived of as being of very high stations, and then that is their understanding, but we should not confuse that with the understanding that there is only one God, Jehovah. From a Muslim perspective, it is not one God, Jehovah Yahweh, who sends his servant. And Matthew recognized that that is what is happening. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 18, Matthew presented Jesus as the servant of Yahweh. And, and that servant was spoken about in, in Isaiah chapter 42. So that's the Messiah in Isaiah 42. That's the Messiah in, in uh, Matthew. And uh, the Messiah is the servant of Yahweh. It is very clear. Dr. Wade? Dr. Wade. Took a little extra time there, so I'll, I'll try to talk. Sure. I mean, uh, the, the text, the text that we're not addressed, Isaiah 9:6 does say that that child who is to be born, uh, that son who is to be given, notice the two, two descriptions. A child is to be born. Jesus was truly born as a child. But a son was given. That's the same root that's found in the third ayah of, of uh, Surat Ali Klaas, Yelet, a child was given. This one, it was called Mighty God, Everlasting Father. And by the way, Everlasting Father there, Abiyat, means Father of Eternity, the one who created all things. That's the descriptions given of Jesus in Colossians chapter 1. That's a fulfillment that's found there. Each one of these texts specifically do refer to the fact that the Messiah is going to be more than merely a Rasul. He has to be more than that to fulfill the Messianic prophecies. And yet those same New Testament writers, where are the people who deny this is what I want to know. Those same New Testament writers identify Jesus as Yahweh, not as a separate God. You're assuming that Yahweh is Unitarian. The whole point of the revelation of the Incarnation, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, is that Yahweh is Trinitarian. It is the Father who sent the Son. The Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Father. But there is one being of God identified as Yahweh, and the Father is identified as Yahweh, the Son is identified as Yahweh, and the Spirit is the Spirit of Yahweh. That is, again, the amazing early testimony of the Christian people itself. Great, thank you. I'm going to begin with the answers. I'm going to stick to the one minute and the 30 seconds of our Andy Fatima, it is your turn. Thank you. My question is addressed to Dr. James. Uh, I forgot the last name, so please forgive me for that. Uh, I'm easily forgettable. <laughs> <laughs> I was lately reading the Gnostic Gospels of Philip's Thomas, and I arrived at the conclusion by reading them very thoroughly. There is no mention of Jesus as being Son of God, number one. 
Number two, if you put emphasis on the books written, the your question, Eddie Fatima. Yeah, yes, the canonical books that are written and included in your um, the theology, you always emphasize they were written by the people who were alive at that time. So my question to you is Barnabas, Thomas, and Phillips were not just alive at that time, they were real disciples of Jesus. How would you not include their gospel in your canonical? Just one quick question. In the Gnostic copy, there was a saying by Arius, the time when the sun was Eddie, not. Eddie Fatima, so this is not the Tuesday night dialogue. You have to step back. <laughs> okay, really quickly. Uh, the Gospel of Barnabas is a, a 14th, 15th century fraud. There, I don't know of any serious historian who believes that that had anything to do with Barnabas at all. Thomas is from the second century. These Gnostic Gospels are all in the second century. They are tinged with Gnosticism. I don't know why Muslims like Gnostics. Gnostics believe Allah is a demon. Hello? They believe the creator of this world was an evil god. I'm not sure why Gnostics like these guys, because I certainly don't like them. And the reason they didn't believe in the uh, crucifixion of Jesus is because they didn't believe Jesus had a physical body to crucify. He wasn't really a man. So here, these people are dualists. They deny the, 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 the fact that the, the physical creation could be good. Only spirits are, 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 are good. All of the physical creation is evil. The, the Gnostic Gospels, I suggest you read them because they are so far removed from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that it's very clear why they were not included, and they also were written in the second century, long after the Canonical of the Gospels. Dr. Ali. From my own studies, uh, I concur that uh, the Gnostic Gospels are, are not the source uh, for uh, our engagement with uh, Christians. Uh, we should engage with Christians based on the Gospels which are there uh, in, in the New Testament uh, collection. Uh, and, and that means also ignoring the Gospel according to Barnabas. Uh, but that does not mean... Ten seconds. Ten seconds? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, that does not mean uh, that uh, the Quranic depiction of the uh, crucifixion event is wrong. In fact, the Quranic depiction is based on earlier sources which... Uh, okay. <laughs> Next question, please. Uh, uh, thank you for being here today. Um, I'll, I'll keep this very brief. I'm sorry I kind of came in last minute. I'm not really too prepared for this, but I do have a Google if you would like to read the, the verses. Um, it is a religious address. I'm oh, sorry, actually, um, to, you, to yourself, I do apologize. I should have mentioned that, but I appreciate you very much mentioned something or had two cents in the end. I would appreciate that. Um, the question is uh, very uh, simple. We can all agree that um, a God is um, one to know everything. It is kind of straightforward that we can all agree about that. I'm pretty sure no one here would disagree that God should know absolutely everything. Um, in the uh, Gospel of Mark and uh, Matthew, I believe it is. And also we can, we can see that there's some, some differences. Your, your question, I please. I do apologize, I'm just getting to it. The, the uh, evolution please evolution hurry up, there are many left there. I do apologize, again, my apologies. So the question is, <laughs> Son says that of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the Son. 
Uh, well, then, if he doesn't know, then all he is is son. He's not God, because it, for, to be God, he has to know when the day of judgment will occur. That's our argument. Twenty-five seconds. How much is that? Okay. Next question. The question for uh, Shabir. Uh, Shabir. Shabir. <laughs> My buddy Shabir. Um, Shabir, um, you mentioned in your um, in your discussion that the uh, you can follow up my question to this. You uh, openly admitted that the story of Jesus taken from the cradle and, and making clay birds and breathing life into them were taken from uh, apocryphal sources. Uh, in Surah 25, a charge is brought against Muhammad that uh, these stories that he has brought are nothing but fables of the ancients. We've all heard them before. They're nice stories, and the response that is given by Allah is say to them, these have come down, they've been sent down from a heavenly source. But you just admitted, and it seems to me you just sided with the unbelievers against Muhammad in admitting that these sources came from earthly origins. My answer to that is no, I do not agree with the non-believers that the sources uh, are, are from earthly origins minus the revelation from God. Uh, for, for Muslim, everything that, that happens is happening by the will of God and by His doing. Uh, the, the Quran says, for example, that God sent down eight pairs of cattle. Uh, some might understand it simplistically that the eight, pair, eight pairs of cattle just dropped out of the sky. Others can understand that there is a certain organic development uh, and that there is cause and effect, there are processes, and God is behind the whole process, so God takes credit for that. So the revelation of the Quran can happen by a certain process, and at the same time, God declares that He is the one who reveals the Quran as He revealed the previous book. Thank you. Did it under one minute. Thank You're you. really getting good. <laughs> Next question. Oh, oh, oh sorry. I'm still got the reason. If you apply what Shabir just asked all of us to apply to the Quran, to the argumentation that he utilizes to take apart the Gospels in a redaction sense, you wouldn't need redaction criticism anymore. If you would just apply the same standard and say, why not allow for divine revelation? Why not allow for harmonization? Why not? That's the exact thing that liberal seminaries don't allow you to discuss in the New Testament class. Thank you. Next question. Uh, I think, uh, my question is to Shabir. Shabir, uh, the way I understand him, he looks at the gospel as, as photographs of Jesus, like, like uh, Mark took a photograph of Jesus, and then Matthew, and then Luke, and then John. They have to be identical. It's not like this. Everyone is drawing a, a portrait of Jesus, like a painting of Jesus, and he's picking up all the material to suit his purpose. He's starting with Mark as a servant. Of course, the servant would have Jesus at, at the least steps, and then you have the son of man, uh, no the question is and, then, and then as the king is uh, Master wrote, and then the son of God, and John wrote. My question to you, Shabir, is this. No, my question to Shabir is this. He, he, he thinks that, that Matthew improved on Mark. How is then in the trial of Jesus, when the high priest asked Jesus whether he was the son of God, in the, in the Gospel of Mark, it said, I am. But in the, in the, in the Gospel of Matthew, you said, how do you see you said an improvement to I am? Okay. Now, uh, in our depiction of the dependence of, of Matthew and Luke on Mark, I have already said that uh, it has to be further nuanced, and this is one of the nuances that you have mentioned. However, the story doesn't end there, because if it, in the question by the high priest, the Son of God is given as uh, an equivalent of the Messiah. And in that case, uh, it is not Son of God, divine uh, second person of the Holy Trinity that develops later on. And if Jesus replied to that, meaning, yes, I am the Messiah, then this is not uh, a, a contrary to the basic presuppositions of, of the Muslim faith. Second, about the various portraits, as James has said, the Gospels were circulated in many different areas. Mark was associated with Rome, uh, Matthew was uh, Antioch, Luke in Caesarea, John in Ephesus. So if these writers are painting different portraits, imagine the fact that it will take many decades uh, only for the people of Caesarea to read John's Gospel to discover that Jesus is the Lord who has come down uh, on, on the earth. Time. Well done. <laughs>
Well, the reality is the question is exactly right. If you're just thinking Matthew's sitting there and he's editing Mark, what? he's gone backwards. The snowball's going the opposite direction. It is one of the many places that just proves that these snowballs are going down the hill of theory that has often been presented. But the other thing to remember is in Mark, Jesus uses the Son of Man language from Daniel chapter 7, and that language uses the highest form of worship of the Son of Man. Jesus applied that to himself. We have to deal with that. Next question, please. As we go forward. Thank you. I can sense that when we draw a triangle, we know sorry, Who's the question for? Uh, for for Dr. Michael. Okay. So my question is that when we draw a triangle, we know that it has three corners and three lines, so everybody can draw a triangle. When we draw a circle, we know that it has no corners, we can draw a circle. But we can definitely not draw something which is a triangle and a circle at the same time. And the simple reason for that is because they, they both are characteristics, it's not just title. Yeah, yeah. Dr. White admitted uh, during his rebuttal that he believes in Jesus, he is the one as a prophet and as a human being, for which I congratulate Dr. White. But then he said that he also believes that he is a God. Now, uh, being God means infallible. Being God means not being hungry, not falling asleep, running the whole universe, having all knowledge, not your, having any knowledge. Question, please. But being so hard as Dr. Dr. White reconcile that if someone can be infallible and fallible, have eternal life, get God killed on cross, have power to do anything, get crying for help and saying that I can not do anything wrong. So how do you reconcile that someone can have both characteristics which are mutually exclusive? That, that is the very essence of the Christian message called the Incarnation. God